This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 122 of Horsemanship Radio, brought to you by Omega Fields, the world's best omega-3 supplements for horses. Horsemanship Radio is a part of the family of the Horse Radio Network, and today we get a chance to catch up with Yanina Mers of Om El Arab Farms, and we meet the man who created the legendary Blenheim Equisports. This is Debbie Laux, and you're listening to The Horsemanship Radio. Thanks for joining us. Horsemanship Radio airs on the 1st and the 15th of the month, and I have my producer, Jen, with me today. Hi, Jen. Greetings, Debbie. How are you? I am good. I'm glad to be back with you again. I was off trotting around the globe, but not very far, to Colorado. That's pretty far. You trotted to Colorado, (laughs) and in my humble opinion, one of the most beautiful states in the country. Uh, it is. You've been there. That's right. Very briefly. But you rode. You got to ride there. Yes, I did. I got to ride with one of our, our listeners, Betty, and she let me ride one of her horses. And it's it's big sky country for a reason. Man, it's yeah. so pretty. So tell it's us so where pretty. you went and why you went there, because we all want to be jealous. Well, the why. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Every, I hope inspiring, because you should do this. Don't just be jealous. Do this. Okay. So the... um. The where is Zapata, the ranch lands. It's in the southeast of Colorado. So if you look at Colorado as a square, it is right above New Mexico. It's really only a couple hours above uh, Alamosa, New Mexico, where some people will know that. And that's really right above Taos, you know, and then there's Santa Fe. And so you get that light. You get that artist light that people always talk about in Taos and northern New Mexico. But this is southern Colorado. So you've got the high desert plains. So there's your, you know, geographic lesson right there where it is. But but in terms of what it looks like for a horse person for the rides, it is unbelievable. I mean, you can see forever and ever and ever. And you're looking across plains. And if you go up on a little rise, you see maybe five, six herds of bison. Yeah. Wild bison. Oh, and wild they're, bison. They're not bison that they, you know, can't oh, oh, I didn't know I don't know that there's a domesticated bison on earth, but, yes, but they are. <laughs> you may keep but, them in a pen, but they're not domesticated. <laughs> oh yeah. And in fact, the guides, you know, we go out with a wrangler or two or three on each ride and uh, they'll just tell you the stories. What I love about this is it's not a nose to tail at all. It's just so much fun because they just, they encourage you to spread out and just like be, you know, wranglers. So we're all wranglers together, but they'll tell us, you know, okay, so uh, fences don't keep bison in. Electric fences slow them down a little bit. That's about it. Yeah. So no, it's, they're wild. And you're seeing as we're, as we're going along, we, we rode Banji through river bottoms. It's all sandy loam, which is like the perfect footing (laughs) on earth because it was, this whole basin was the bottom of this huge glacier lake you know, a thousand years ago. And because of that, when it all dried up, the uh, wind, it sweeps across that prairie. It blew all the sandy bottom, not all of it yet, actually, but it blew sandy bottom up into these, what they call the great dunes. And is that fun? I feel like I'm in Saudi Arabia all of a sudden, (laughs) right? Over these dunes that are just, there's iron ore through them. So it makes these flecks of black. I mean, it's an artist's dream. I can't draw a stick, but it's an artist's dream as far as the light and the scenery and everything goes. And it's really great. You know, it's a great horse that you produce out of this too, because their legs are always sound. Their feet are like mustangs. You know, they're just honed in that river bottom and the sand. And it's it's and you know what? They turn them loose at night. They don't even supplement them. They don't even have to feed hay or anything. They throw them back out on the uh, in a pasture area that they hold the horses in, and they drive them up every night. And I mean, every day in the morning, and they take the horses out that they're going to use that day, and then let them go back out to the field and they're just horses. They are just horses most of the time. That's so cool. So Zapata is really a ranch. Zapata. Zapata. Yeah, they, I'll get it right I, one of these guys times. That's Zapata. Right. <laughs> kind of like Zapata. That's it's cute. really a, a really a place where horse crazy people can go and be 12 years old all over again. Exactly. Maybe 11. Maybe <laughs> 11. So do you, do you bring your own horse? Can you bring your own horse? 
I don't think people do bring their own horses, but that's something you could ask them if they maybe make a, they're very accommodating there. It's run by the ranch land. So they have four properties that the ranch land maintains. It's actually owned by the nature conservancy, which is one of those conservationist organizations. Yeah, it's a .org out there. And so that ranch lands is there. They'll create the management of it. They maintain the bison herd. They have Angus cattle up there that they make money with. They, they have hospitality, which was we a part of. And don't even get me started on the food and the wine and everything. Because we're going to be talking about some of these episodes coming up. Because I got four interviews that you are going to love. I mean, I could. I was talking to these gals anyway. I'm like, wait a minute. Get out the recorder. Yeah, there you <laughs> go. Missed opportunity. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. And so I think our next two episodes after this one are going to be filled with the adventures that we were on in uh, Zapata. In, it's Mosca, Colorado, if you're really looking for where it is on the map. But it is a land on its own. And we'll talk about how they are maintaining it, what their goals and visions are for the future of the land, obviously in conservation mode, but how they have so many people accessing it. So it's not one of those, you know, people go away. Things, yeah, so. exactly. They're really encouraging people to participate. Well, that's, that's kind of interesting. And I can't wait to hear these interviews because you did them. So I haven't gotten to hear them yet because the two guests we have this week mm-hmm. really relate to that because our first guest, RJ Brandis is He's doing the same thing in his own way. He is creating opportunities for people to participate in equestrianism in a different way in with the showgrounds. And he's he's getting people people to participate both on the horse and as spectators because he's creating Mm -hmm. um, facilities and experiences that appeal to both. Yep. And our second guest is doing the same thing in that she's creating that legacy of participation as a breeder and someone who can continue to move the the species forward and for her it's mm-hmm. particularly in, in Arabians but both people mm-hmm. also creating legacies because they're really doing that at the ranch lands they're creating that cultural um, yeah. grounding that we have kind of lost in the past few generations to uh, nature and to participating in outdoor activities with our horses Yeah, yeah, exactly. You nailed it. I I just think that they're so inspiring because they're, you can hear their passion about what they're doing and you can hear the generational legacy making that they've got in their hearts and they've got the wherewithal to do it. These guys are sharp and trained and scientific about it. And I mean, it it keeps horses in people's lives, bottom line. And for that we stand for. And so you're going to love this, this chat that Debbie has with RJ because he's a man who has been so incredibly successful in the business world. Yet he's, he's obviously so excited and so passionate about this equestrian project. It's, he's kind of like a little kid again. It's really great to listen Mm -hmm. to. (laughs) So we're going to get right to it right after we hear from Omega Fields. Hi, Joe Camp here to share about Omega Fields. Omega Fields exists to help you keep your first promise to the horses you love, to care for them well. Nutrition is the foundation of a healthy life and supports all the activity that brings you and your horse so much joy. Omega-3s from flax are the cornerstone of that foundation. So, coupled with the finest ingredients and their proprietary pure glean flax stabilization process, they created Omega Horse Shine, Omega Horse Shine Complete, Omega Nibblers, Low Sugar and Starch, Omega Antioxidant, and Proventum Probiotic Soft Treats. Thousands of horses are experiencing a vibrant life with the help of Omega Fields products, including all of ours, a part of helping you keep your promise to your friends. Nutrition for a healthy life isn't just their slogan. It's their purpose. R.J. Brandis is an owner of Blenheim Equisports, which is one of the fastest growing venue management firms in the equestrian show business. In 2000 and 2004, Mr. Brandis had the honor of hosting the Olympic trials for the U.S. equestrian show jumping team at his facility in San Juan Capistrano. Blenheim Equisports venues are ranked in the top 25 of all horse show facilities in North America. Mr. Brandis is currently focusing his efforts on development of Silver Lakes at Silver Lakes Park, 100 
122-acre property in the city of Norco, Southern California. Some people know of that. Silver Lakes is now the largest youth soccer and entertainment venue in California. That's saying something. Mr. Brandis's vision is to include an indoor sports facility, a covered arena, and additional equestrian fields as well. Well, welcome, R.J. Brandis. I'm honored to have you on Horsemanship Radio. How are you? Very well, thank you. I'm so glad that we've been able to talk and meet. We've met recently, and I'm quite impressed with everything you've done and are doing. It's really fun. Um, it's so encouraging what you're doing with the equestrian sports, and I would say public access to see these gorgeous and talented horses and riders. Is that what your goal was to do? Well, you know, I've always been involved in horses. I started out in Connecticut. I, I started riding at about nine at Oxridge, which is the holy grail of the East Coast in terms mm-hmm. of hunter jumpers, and uh, gave it up stupidly because I thought it was a it was a girl sport. I should have stayed there because I could have been the rooster in the hen house. <laughs> but right. I gave that up, and uh, then uh, later on, I met a beautiful girl and decided to start riding again. Mm-hmm. And uh, then when I moved to Argentina. In my late twenties, I started. I learned to play polo. So, it's been a, a real part of my passion in life: horses and animals. So, to to have the opportunity in California to build uh, the the Olympic trials in 2000 and get the Olympic Committee to agree to have the U.S. horse trials for the Olympics at Blenheim, a facility I built, was a a great honor. And then to get it duplicated in 2000. Four, when we had a, a really big uh, uh, U.S. trials there, we had about three or four thousand people at the trials, and we had, you know, we had the Blue Angels at the floor. So it was the last time that the United States held trials. Uh, subsequently, uh, George Morris, who was then chef to keep, went on to believe that the only way the team could really qualify or understand who their competition was was to to, to go against them in Europe. So really the last big trials in the United States were held at Blenheim Equisports and uh, at Blenheim uh, facilities in San Juan. Yeah, it's, uh, it's quite a facility too. It's beautiful. I've, uh, you've invited me there a couple of times now and I must say thank you again. It's beautiful. It's an experience and everybody should should have that experience, one who loves horses. How did the leaping from horses to event facilities, do you do everything that grand? I mean, that was a, that was a huge leap to create the greatest facilities that we have in the U.S. to perform in. Um, why did the event facilities become important to you? Well, first of all, I, I built a farm called Blenheim Farms. At the, at the time, I was there was a facility that was quite famous called the Oaks, and Joan Irvine Smith started that, and Joan was my neighbor, and we we together partnered up to do the 2000 2004 trials. She's she's been a serious player in the in in the equestrian, particularly in the hunter jumper world, for the last 40 or 50 years, both here and in in Virginia, because she has a place in Virginia. Mm-hmm. So it was it was a natural. Uh, we built out the facility. Uh, our two properties were contiguous to what was nice. called then the polo fields. And then we took it where I bought uh, into a horse show operation. And I think we ended up with 20 uh, uh, A or double A horse shows. And I think about 20, 18 to 20,000 horses a year go to those horse shows yeah. or did in their peak. So uh, I'm no longer involved in that one because when I went on to decide to build Silver Lakes, which is in Norco, which is in mm-hmm. Horsetown, USA, uh, right. I, there was a conflict for me to have a facility in San Juan and build another facility in Norco. So I, my children are involved. Melissa and my daughter are the runners and owners of that facility with Robert Ridland, who was my partner and still is my partner or was my partner. And he's now the chef to keep the Olympic teams in the United States. That's and that's what he does. Most of the time, the rest of the time, he uh, manages what is, what I think, one of the, it's certainly the, one of the best facilities west of the Rockies. I, mm-hmm. You have a couple of really good facilities in the United States. Now you have Tryon, where the, where the, the, the wedge was Wag. there, where the, mm-hmm. where the Wag was there recently. Mm-hmm. And you have, obviously, Kentucky. And uh, then you have Florida, mm-hmm. which is the, the 9,000-pound elephant. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, I mean, if people thought about it, 
who, you know, who is it that has the ability to put something together like the huge facilities that you have? It's got to be somebody who's passionate about horses and it's got to be somebody who's pretty sharp to be able to negotiate the, not only the real estate, but the network of people. So um, we appreciate you, RJ Brandis, for allowing people to continue to have access to see these horses in their most gorgeous states when they're trained to do what their discipline is at their epitome. And tell us a little bit about Melissa. I I got to meet Melissa out there. I know she's running these things too. Was she the daughter that you ended up buying so many horses for? Oh, no. (laughs) There's there's another. I have four daughters. Okay. Melissa's the eldest and the youngest was uh, Catherine Charlotte Brandis. And uh, she started riding at nine. And uh, she went through at Blenheim Farms through the whole system and was in the Young Riders and was silver medal in the Young Riders. And I think she was number two or three in the National Horse Show. So she had a pretty serious junior equestrian career. Uh, we went through 57 horses to get her there. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, you have to be well mounted in this sport. It's not about just you. It's about you and your pal. No, that's horse right. and, uh, and a partner, and uh, yeah, if 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 he doesn't want to jump him, you're not going to do him. I assure you. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I just have to say one thing to you, Debbie, and that's that if if I've been impressed by any other location in the horse world, I think what your father's done at Flag Up Farms, oh, and nice. obviously Adrian's a big advocate of what mm-hmm. it is, and she's already trying to convince me to buy our fourth house. We, we have one in Dublin, one in Aspen, and now. She thinks we should have one up there too. Oh, so you've so. done me a, a real disfavor here <laughs> to, to get back in the horse world. And uh, my, you know, Adrian's horse has been up there for quite a while, and you know, Miguel's taken done just an amazing job on our Frisian. So I have to thank you for that. I appreciate that. So your wife, Adrian Brandis, rides a beautiful Frisian horse named Dolce, <laughs> who is, we, yeah. we'll call him formally a handful. Um, how proud of you are, are, are you of her working with him? Well, you know, uh, I was, I was, I had a little intrepidation because, you know, I think when you start riding seriously at 60, and she just had her 60th birthday, as you know, right, you're very there. publicly, so it's okay. Uh, there, yeah, it, it's okay. It, it's, it's, you know, it, I had some pretty bad falls, but I was in my 30s playing polo because I lived in Argentina mm-hmm. and played polo, and you know, that's the center of the world for polo. I, it is. I, yeah. You know, two times I was in Palermo with. I thought I'd gone to heaven. Of course, we lost the first game, so there was no problem because we weren't a very good team. No. But um, you know, Adrian, Adrian is a is a you know a amateur rider trying to become better, and he had a difficult horse, and I was concerned. Yeah. And yeah. your farm, and your dad, and your and Miguel made a difference. Thank you. Well. Very wisely, uh, when you know you're in over your head, you get some help, and she, <laughs> she did. And I, yeah, I think that really nice. saved the relationship, which is wonderful. Yeah, and Dolce yeah. is not only a beautiful Frisian horse. I mean, aren't all Frisians, I think, terrifically beautiful. But he is young, so she was brave that way too, and and super athletic. And uh, you know, she really, she really did have her hands full. But I mean, I think she is like one of the bravest. 60 some things that um that I know in really treating it like professionally and going at it like she she was determined to become a better writer and I I think that's what I'm yeah. most proud of her for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So so uh, you lived in Argentina for for 10 years I think. That's quite a stint. Yes, yes, Did you play polo that whole time? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Oh, and minus to the two which is you know a two handicap in the United States is good but not great. In Argentina, that's like going from a, a corporal to a uh, to a, a full bird colonel in the in the in the, in the army. Go. You know, it's a it's a big deal. It is. So it, there are more ten handicap players in Argentina, particularly at the time, the Haragis. Mm-hmm. But there were four mm-hmm. brothers who had all ten handicaps when I played. Crazy. Yeah, no, and Argentina still this this is season right now. We're we're as we're speaking, it's October, yeah. and they're coming into their high season in Argentina. Do you ever get the itch to go back and see a little polo played well? You know, I, I think was I, I I enjoy I go to we go to Santa Barbara every once in a while to see that. That's that's the best in the West here. Uh, or yes. you have to go to you know have to go to Florida to Miami to see what's going on to really understand it, uh, uh, or England. 
I wish I'd gone to all of them. But, uh, you know, I, it was a part of my life, and uh, I've just sort of moved on. I mean, it's either I'd rather play than watch in yeah. everything I do. It, there you go. That is an R.J. Brandis statement. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. And you play hard. So Silver Lakes is really your baby right now. It's a focus for you, in, at least in the equestrian sport world. Yeah. Uh, but it's not just equestrian sports out there. You're really taking on uh, the entertainment world. Well, you know, it's it's a, it, it was a challenge because uh, it really started out that uh, I saw this piece of property, which I thought was iconic because my background really is 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 finance, and I was in you know at a, a pretty big finance company. And so when I saw the location on the 15 with uh, at that time 122 acres, and it, it wasn't really something that was the best and highest use wasn't. A, a, a soccer facility or sports facility it was either a large shopping center with a with Walmart in it or, or, mm. you know, 3000 homes. So, and then the next thing I did was I got up in a chopper, which I always do when I go to a new market to understand the market. And I figured out that we were in the fastest growing market in 2006 in America. And today there's a million people within seven miles of Silver Lakes. Wow. And in the next 10 years, there'll be a million Two million two hundred thousand. So you know, there are a few places in this in the world that I've been to that started out very modestly, like the Masters, and I've been there four times. It's Augusta, and I've been to you know to uh, England, as I'm sure you have, Debbie, to uh, mm-hmm. to, to see tennis played. Uh, and mm-hmm. and the town started out with six tennis courts, and then it ended up the whole place, the whole hamlet there turned into, I don't know, 40 courts. And and yeah. I think Silver Lakes has a chance to be something special in the next mm-hmm. 10 years. It's already the largest uh, soccer youth facility uh, west of the Rockies and, and certainly in the high-density market of 23 million people. There's, there are very few places you've got 122 acres. And we believe it'll, exp- it'll expand to about 225 acres. Mm-hmm. As you compare that to Disney, Disney the proper part of Disney with the additional 25 acres for uh, the Star Wars portion is 100 acres. Yeah. There you so go. This, this, is, this is a big piece of land for us to control for youth sports. And it was really about a legacy. I wanted to do something like your father uh, to leave for the future. And mm-hmm. uh, uh, it, it uh, about a million, 400,000 people there last year. About uh, probably a million six to a million seven uh, this next year in 2019, and we'll top out around two million uh, two hundred thousand, which will make us about the third largest attraction in Southern California. And it's really wow. three business models: it's 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 youth sports, uh, equestrian. I'm building a new equestrian facility with a covered arena, not as large as yours, but 200 <laughs> by 400. And then we're also in the concert business. Where we've where we've had several concerts and we're negotiating several long-term uh, concert agreements with which will bring about three to four hundred thousand people a year to to Nor- to Norco. My goodness, Silver Lake. Yeah, and I love that it's near Norco. I mean, what do they call Norco? The horse capital of the U.S. Horsetown, so. USA. It's called Horsetown, it's USA. Horsetown, USA. Yeah. There you go. It's yeah. perfect. And and the McDonald's, you can ride up and uh, right to the yeah, takeout yeah, window yeah. on your horse. And they've got yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. hitching and posts right yeah. in front of every little convenience store. And it is really fun. So it, it fits it fits that equestrian. What's something that you, yeah. you'd like people to understand about your vision that matters most to you, RJ? Well, first of all, I, I want to talk about the partnership with Norco. It's been a fantastic mm-hmm. partnership. They're a fantastic small town uh, who decided to to, to to do something big. And we've had offers from 15 or 20 other uh, counties and things to build another Silver Lakes. But this little town of 24,800 people got behind Silver Lakes, and we made it happen. And uh, it's really about Silver Lakes is a hub to all sorts of different communities, whether it's the riding community, was the the youth sports community, uh, Sports world like uh, lacrosse, uh, rugby, we're doing there, and obviously soccer is our major sport. We have a rather large catering business, and we have a very nice restaurant there. So it's a it's a it's a paradigm shift in how youth sports entertainment will be done in America. So I think you'll see more of them, whether I build them or not, someone else will. 
That's wonderful. Well, I hope you get your magic touch on all of them if we can, because it really does look like a delightful place for families to go. And it really is out in the middle of a, of a kind of deserty part of Southern California that I think you're just turning into an oasis. It's it's a beautiful yeah. thought and it's a beautiful beginning to uh, a great idea. So I appreciate you coming on. I'd love to follow up with you, RJ, if we have, you know, Anytime. things that come up. Yeah. Anytime. Love it. Well, love it. Love your Yeah, thank you for being on Horsemanship Radio. Hi, Carol Herter here, president of Cavallo, home of the world's most trusted and popular hoof boots. You know, one of the most interesting parts of what I do is the many horsey stories I get to hear. Most of them are really uplifting. Some are stories of challenges, and a few are downright sad. Recently, a wonderful woman took the time to approach us at a show to share a story about her horse who went down in quicksand. It started out as a really scary story. We were holding our breaths, waiting for the outcome, and it turned out wonderful. They winched the horse out relatively unscathed, albeit, you know, a little traumatized, and everyone standing around were super amazed that he still had his cavallo hoof boots on. Scary story with a good ending. Another testament to Cavallo. If you don't have a pair for your horse, it's time. Cavallos are easy to put on, easy to take off when you want to take them off, and they stay on. They stay on in all terrain. Cavallo, the world's most trusted hoof boots. Yanina Murs owns Om El Arab Farm in the picturesque San Inez Valley in California. The name Om El Arab translates to mean Mother of All Arabians in Arabic, and their breeding program began 40 years ago in the Black Forest in Germany before it moved to the San Inez Valley. The Om El Arab breeding program is acclaimed as a world leader in producing world, international, and national champions. Well, welcome, Yanina Murs. Glad to have you back on Horsemanship Radio. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for inviting me back. I'm glad you're back. And I'm I'm assuming you're in San Inez Valley right now. Is that right? I am. I just got home from a trip to Germany mm. where we were at a horse show called the All Nations Cup. Um, and uh, But I've been back for a week and it's so nice to be home. Oh, I'm glad you're home. I know it's, you start turning inward at this time of the year. I know we don't have a lot of seasons in San Inez Valley, but it feels like a season's turning a little Especially- bit. Especially today. We have clouds and it's very fall like here today. It's nice. Oh, well, good. I'm glad you're cozy at home. Well, 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 I got to do the interview with you, the first one people can refer back to at your beautiful farm, which was just amazing in your tack room with all the trophies and the ribbons. And it just it was so historic and it was wonderful for you to open up your farm like that, too. And do you do you do that for other people as far as can people come and visit and see your horses if they have a purpose for being there? Absolutely. We have visitors all the time, um, mm-hmm. sometimes daily. So as long as we have a little bit of a heads up, um, anybody can make an appointment and come. Very nice of you because it, it is beautiful and it's quite an experience. So people should take you up on that. If they go to the San Diego Valley to see horses, this is one of those stops you have to make. And there's a lot of great stops in the San Diego Valley. There's so many disciplines across the valley anymore. It's just almost unrec. We moved there in '66, which dates me a little bit, but it tells you um, it tells you that there weren't that many horses really in the valley. But since then, it's just been. It's been very cool to see the development. Wine and horses. How bad is that life, huh? Not bad at all. (laughs) And we have um, we have almost eleven acres in vineyard here on the farm too. Do you really? You do have eleven. And your brother—that's right. Your brother is the agricultural side of the horses. Am I right? Yeah. Exactly. He has a vineyard management company, so that's he he takes care of that, and then he grows some of our hay too. And then I take care of the horse part. It's a wonderful life, and it is a beautiful life out there. I'm so glad to have you back. Because last time you mentioned that um, your experiences in life and that your family's generational legacy, which I appreciate, you were considering how to mentor others and and keep the industry at the forefront of of the way it's been and, uh, and build on it, too. So tell me what you've been up to since we last spoke. So we've had um, three clinics here on the farm since we last talked, um, two confirmation clinics. So we kind of have an annual confirmation clinic that's 
I think it'll be the last weekend in July uh, every year. And we have a wonderful friend named Cindy Reich, who is an Arabian horse judge, and she's a reproduction specialist. And um, she's just one of the most knowledgeable people I know. And she teaches the course um, here on the farm, and it's a two-day event. And we um, we use – there's classroom work, but then we also go and, and actually judge, judge a lot of the horses. And um, I think it's a really great experience for people to – have the classroom education part, yet then be able to translate that to you know, to actually looking at horses in the flesh because it's always a little different when you're looking at the actual horse mm-hmm. rather than yeah. just the drawing. Um, and you're using really your horses? Beautiful. Yeah, that sounds yeah, great. Do. You're using yeah, your horses. Use horse. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We use our horses. And then um, sometimes we'll, we'll put, you know, our horses are all kind of very similar in style. So sometimes we'll use some client horses too that are maybe different bloodlines and just look a little bit different, so that there's a little bit of everything in these in in the class in the quote unquote class that we're judging. Fun. But it's been really fun, and the feedback we've gotten from the the guests that have attended has been really really good, and it just ignites sort of you know even a little bit more of the passion for the Arabian mm-hmm. horse. Mm-hmm. Well, who who comes? And... Tell me to tell me. I mean, it's new, so um, or yeah, or have you been doing um, this a long time? No, we've had two of okay. them. So we did it. We did it in 2017 in July, and then again just this okay. last July. And um, and two years ago, we had it was really fun. We had a lot of um, kids that came because they there's a youth, there are youth judging teams throughout the country. Oh. So we had a youth judging team from from Southern California come, and they were so this last this last July they were at youth nationals actually competing. So they didn't come to our events. But the year before, they I, I think it didn't coincide with Youth Nationals, so they were there. So anyway, we had the we had a whole lot of you know kids that were I think between the ages of maybe ten and fifteen, nice. um, and they camped out at the farm, mm-hmm. and I mean it was amazing. And there were you know there were breeders breeders that flew in from across the country, so it it sort of that you know people that have been breeding horses for forty years, and so mm-hmm. so it was like a full spectrum thing. It was for for young people that are learning about horses to people that have been around in the industry for many, many years. And I feel like it was valuable for, for everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, There were also some people that were new to the industry that came, a family of a family that came and and I think it was really valuable for them. They were, they came the first year. And then this last time we had people from China that came, Wow. Uh, you know, it was, it, I think it really, it's one of those events that, if you're interested in horses or if you love horses and you want to know more, it, it's a really great event to attend. Even if it's not, if Arabian horses isn't your breed, um, you know, because confirmation is confirmation. And then there's just mm-hmm. Arabian type added to Arabian confirmation. So so it would be valuable for for anyone, not just yeah. Arabian horse people. Yeah, I love to hear that you've got kids involved in that too, because kids and just a good confirmation is a great you know, foundation for, for kids yeah. to, to get into. And it does excite for the, for the industry, which is pretty cool. And in your environment, how fun camping out. That would be so cool as a kid. <laughs> Love that. I know they, they had, they pitched a tent in front of the barn on the lawn. It was really sweet, really, really That's sweet. Fun. I and hope that inspires other breeds. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. And they had fun walking around, you know, in the evening and just like being with the horses. Mm-hmm. So it was great. It was really nice. Oh, really nice. So, so your philosophy, just to reiterate a little bit from the last one, is is that you want to perpetuate the the ideal of the breed and the confirmation of the breed. And um, so, to that end, you have been breeding horses generationally, going back your mom, Siggy, and uh, before her, her father. Um, I think that was some of that's sort of a thumbnail of what we talked about before. Um, what do you see the future? And you're, what are you telling the kids or the people that come to these courses about perpetuating the enjoyment of these horses? You know, the one of the reasons that I wanted to do this was um, that there isn't really a place for people to go and learn horse mm-hmm. confirmation, other than if they're actually going to a just school. And so I, and, and people people that buy horses or want to start breeding, they don't really have a foundation other than, you know, if they've picked up books on their own or have a mentor or something. And so I think it's just a really nice place to start or even a place to continue learning and so, and I want, I, I want to make sure that our breed is um, armed with, you know, 
with the next generation that 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 knows about horses and knows mm-hmm. about you know what they're supposed to look like rather than just breeding a pretty horse to a pretty mm-hmm. horse you know yeah you, you, there, it's more than that and so, so I just I, I I do all of this because I love the Arabian horse and I and I want to make sure that our breed moves forward in the best way possible and so education to me is key. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I love your, I read a quote from your mom who is now passed, but obviously you've picked up the, the baton and you're running with it and doing a great job. But she said that one of the ideals of the breed is that they're showy, but friendly and they pass it on. Tell me about mm-hmm. that. Well, so our foundation mare Stopa was, mm-hmm. um, was a mare that my mom bought in Spain in 1970 and um, every horse on the farm is related to that mare. And she was, you know, she had that Arabian, part of Arabian type is they pop their tails up over their backs. They are animated. They, you know, their nostrils flare. They do a little snort and blow, you mm-hmm. know, as they trot off. Yet with that mare in particular, she would do all of that showy stuff. But then we children would ride her. You know, my, there's a mm-hmm. there's a pretty famous picture of me and my brother on her. I was three and he was one. And she no. doesn't even have a halter on and she's in a pasture. <laughs> like, <laughs> I have a four-year-old. I don't know if I would You're not sure. to do that with these, you know, these days. But that's that's how she was. And so you, they would have probably taken the children off and scuffled their feet and she'd have popped <laughs> their tail over and snorted and trotted off, you know. So it, it's really important to have to have both. Yeah, Arabians get a little bit of a reputation that they're crazy, but I think that they can have, or I, to me it's really important, our, our particular bloodlines um, have both, where they have the showiness and the, the snortiness, yet they're rideable and trainable and sensible and smart and, um, you know, can, can do things beyond just be a pretty show horse yeah yeah and uh, yeah and this is what you're famous for this is what you you have been able to do but you have a new horse that has come on to own or maybe is still coming alamina alamina is the first female in over 20 years i read to be added to the yes, mm-hmm. yes. okay but alamina was, was bred at the famous state stud janos podlaski in poland and um, she is six years old now, so I guess seven or eight years ago, one of our stallions, Oma Bolisimo, uh, was sent to Yana Fudlowski two years. They leased him, and um, one of the stipulations released was that we were allowed to choose one of his daughters. Mm-hmm. And so my mom actually went back to Poland twice um, and looked at the foals, and um, the director at the time, Dr. Mark Trella, uh, is a dear friend and um, a wonderful man and an incredible horseman. And he said to my mom, don't rush, just take your time, come back again and, you know, pick the best one for you. And so when she went, when Alamina was two years old, uh, my mom went to Poland. And um, mm-hmm. the Polish horses in particular are known for incredible movement. And, and so they trotted Alamina, they trotted all of the Bolismo fillies and Colts actually out for her in a straight line. Mm -hmm. And Alamina came out and just did this hesitation trot, you know, alongside of her handler. And my mom (laughs) loved her and wanted Mm -hmm. to bring her to Omel Arab. And it was, it was interesting because Dr. Trella had pick number one and pick number two, and she had pick number three. And so she kept her poker face and, Mm -hmm. um, and um, let him pick. And he picked two other fillies and, and then she, picked Alamina and and he told her afterwards that he knew that that was going to be the filly that she would pick and so Alamina traveled to the United States um that that fall okay. and um she's had three folds for us now oh, and okay. uh, three fillies actually and I am so so blessed to have her in our in our herd of broodmares and so mm-hmm. it's interesting so we everything is based on a stopa right and so mm-hmm. her and, and we do everything kind of with, by tail female lines. So um, Estopa is in the tail female line of almost all of our mares and many of our stallions as well. So Alamina brings a new tail female line into the herd because she's pure Polish um, on the female side, yet Omel Bellissimo is very line bred to Estopa. So although Alamina brings new blood, she's five times Estopa in her pedigree, which is really, really interesting. You know, so she she looks... Um, phenotypically very much like our horses. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And then when she moves, she brings another, like another yeah. dimension of, mm. of Polish. It's really cool. Yeah. And so she has given us two, two fillies that are full sisters by our stallion, Omel Alazim. And then she had a gorgeous filly this year by Omel Sanon. And I'm really pleased with them. They're they're pretty spectacular. Wow. You're doing amazing, amazing stuff. And you're a scientist too, just to listen to you talk about the pedigrees and breeding and everything too. I know that's part of the, part of the skill set that you bring to the, to the industry too. Hmm? Yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess there are people that are actual geneticists breed, you know, with that in mind. And, and, and I think, I feel like my mom and I did that sort of intuitively rather mm-hmm. than, than really, you know, consciously. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But breeding is, it's interesting because it is science, but it is an art. And then there's a whole lot of sort of gut feeling and, and intuition that goes into it. Too. I remember what you said about erudite, that when you, when you were reaching for that, um, ideal, you, you, it was not about what was on paper for their breeding. It was about the attitude that you were looking for. And I, yep. that's where the art yep. comes in that mixes with yep. science that the, that the really good breeder looks for. Yep. And, and I just love, I love what you're doing, but I love your philosophy about priming for the future too. I, I just think that it's, it takes you, Yanina, and others in in their disciplines or in their breeds to really make the world tick for horses in the future. And I want to encourage you because I just think you're you're amazing for what you're doing. Do you think we could ever be Poland over here and Poland would be looking to us for, <laughs> for the greatest horses? Or is that always going to be Mecca? Well, they do. They do actually look to us because... Um, mm-hmm us, just us, meaning us, the world, because they, they have been bringing in stallions mainly from, that are not pure Polish, you know, for the last, gosh, I guess maybe even 15 years now, maybe even a little longer. And, and their horses have become better for it. I mean, the purists will disagree because they want them to stay pure, but I, I feel like, you know, and then bringing Bolisima over was, was them looking here gotcha. to bring in something that they needed. So I think when they were bringing in Bellissimo, they were looking for a little length of leg and even, a, even more type, you know, even more, more refinement. And so, and so they, they go, they go, they're going all over the place to, to kind of keep improving their herd, which is the same as what I do. That's you good. know, I go and try to improve the herd too, by finding a little bit of this and a little bit of that here and there mm-hmm. while still re- keeping the integrity of the Omel Arab look. Mm-hmm. So, well, that's good. So, so really the world is just getting smaller and, and everybody's trying to, to perpetuate and even idealize where, where you're going with the breed. Mm, that's yeah. good. But, but I think that, you know, um, it's important to, um, it's actually a little bit of a Pandora's box, really, this, this topic. But it's important to, you know, like in my case, be a bit of a purist and keep the Omel Arab style. Yet, um, I have to outcross also, yeah. um, bring in new blood and, 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 and get things kind of modern, yet still retain the, the essence of what we've always tried to do. And, and in Poland, they have to do the same thing. And, and mm. in Spain, you know, there's the Spanish Arabian. That's right which Estopa was pure Spanish, right? And so it became a little bit old fashioned to just breed pure Spanish horses. And so they, they kept adding Egyptian horses or Polish horses or Russian, you know, whatever they Mm -hmm. would, they would outcross them. And I'm told now that they're, they're kind of going back to trying Mm -hmm. to breed, breed pure Spanish horses. So that, because it is important, it's important for the Arabian breed to have something a little bit, more within its lines, you know, mm-hmm. so that we have, so that I can go to Spain, for example, find another horse to bring to this breeding program that is maybe pure Spanish. So, so we need to, we need to keep them somewhat pure, yet we need to outcross and, and modernize, yet we need to retain all that at the same time. So that's kind of the fine line. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. There's, yes, it does make sense, of course. And you're thinking generationally, which I just love. Absolutely, and uh, yeah. yeah, and you're young, Yanina. You've got a huge career ahead of you in this. If you call it a career, I think it probably you wouldn't. You'd probably just call it what you do. But um, but I love what you do. And I think it's well, um, it's good for the breed and everything. And and I we'd love to have you over at Flags Up Farm sometimes too to, to um, share a little bit about some cross-pollination 
of what yeah, your no, I philosophies love, are. I would love that. I, I actually haven't been. And the last time you invited me, I, I can't remember where I was going, but I was doing something. And, oh, that's um, right. So please let me know again. I will. I will. I will. We'll find, yeah, we'll find a fun thing to do over there and, and get together. Great. Well, thanks again. We've, we've used your time again, I hope wisely, on Horsemanship Radio, and we love having you. So as news comes out, please let us know, and maybe we'll make some of our own. Sounds good. <laughs> All Thank right. you so much. It was my pleasure, and it's always fun to talk to you. Monty Roberts is proud to partner with the Right Horse Initiative, which seeks to help horses in transition by massively increasing horse adoption in the United States. The Right Horse understands that most horses will have multiple owners during their lifetime. Often, these horses find themselves in transition due to no fault of their own and can move into a second or third career with the right adopter. Adoption can be a great option when you're looking for a new horse. To help you find your perfect right horse, the Right Horse Initiative developed an innovative new website for adoptable horses called My Right Horse. On MyRightHorse.org, you can search hundreds of available horses by breed, discipline, age, and location. It's simple, user-friendly, and of course, mobile-friendly too. With a wide range of adoptable horses from all over the country, MyRightHorse.org can help you find the horse of your dreams. Visit MyRideHorse.org to find your next horse through adoption. Whisper the language of the herd. Listen, you don't have to say a word. It's time for Jamie Jennings to fetch an email from Monty Roberts' inbox and share a morsel of Monty's wisdom in a little segment we like to call Ask Monty. Leave this world a better place than mine. The magic in the language of the Dear Monty, herbal remedies are a controversial issue. I've been doing some research about them and was wondering what you thought about these remedies, such as lavender oil, bach flower remedies, rescue remedy, etc. Do they really work or will they hurt my horse? Monty's answer. I have no evidence that herbal remedies have ever hurt a horse. I use rescue remedy for myself, and I have also used rescue remedy for horses, too. I also use rescue cream and an assortment of buck flower remedies. It is very difficult to prove that they are effective, but I feel certain that they are doing no harm. The evidence in favor of rescue remedy is quite strong, and I know that many people worldwide are using it for many purposes. However, one should never allow the use of herbal remedies to exclude the potential for conventional care and medication. An experienced equine veterinarian should consistently be consulted so as to give one's horse the best of both worlds. I am a strong believer in the four life transfer factor. There's an enormous bank of evidence being logged as we speak about how effective this natural substance is in bolstering the immune system. I have some very strong evidence of how effective it is. My wife, Pat, is active in helping me study many of these natural substances, such as COQ10 and grapeseed extract. I can say with strong conviction that many of these natural substances work, and I do not know that it would any would hurt your horse. As for their being controversial, this would imply that there's a potential for harm, and I don't believe that is a reasonable assumption. The only part of all of this that might be controversial is whether or not you should choose to spend the money on them. I do, and that is my choice. No controversy here. Monty. For more of these insights into good horsemanship go to www.montyroberts.com and click on the orange banner that says, Get Free Horse Tips. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged, in November, November 2nd, coming right up tomorrow, Monty Roberts' tour of Germany and its 15th anniversary in Fulden, Fulda, Germany. Then November 10th, he will be in Nubelik, Germany. And then he hops over December 1 and 2 to Hungary, where he will be the Monty Roberts Join-Up Master Demonstration at the Budapest Horse Show in Hungary. And then long-term planning, February 15 to 17 in 2019 now. That's the President's Day weekend. So it's 
it's a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. President's Day will then be on Monday, so you can travel home. We'll be an equine facility management clinic at Flag is Up Farms. That's through the CHA organization that certifies equine facility managers. And then another long-term hold this date is the movement. We did this last year for its first inaugural, and we're back this year with a two-day April 29 and 30 at Flag is Up Farms. The movement, 2018.com, can tell you a little bit about that. That's the website. And if you did not commit that to memory, and I know I certainly didn't, you can get all of that and so much more (laughs) at the website. That would be montyroberts.com. Or you can give Flag is Up Farms a call. That's right. They answer the phone and they have wonderful, knowledgeable, and kind folks who do it. The phone number there is Mm -hmm. 805-688-6288. And for details about today's show, go to horsemanshipradio.com, episode 122. And there you will find links, photos, and more information about our guests. And we love your feedback. It gives us ideas to do things on the shows possible guests if you just want to say you like us that always helps stroke uh, our egos we appreciate that too yeah encouraging sure us. encouraging and, uh, you can do that on facebook just look up monty <laughs> roberts on facebook look for the one with a little blue check mark that's the official monty roberts page you can also follow him on twitter it's monty underscore roberts and if i remember right on instagram it is also monty underscore roberts yeah yay It is at Monty Roberts, Monty underscore Roberts. See, you do better than I do. Yeah, very good. Thank you. I'm pushing that Instagram. Debbie is very modern. She's an Instagram nut now. I don't even know how to get on Instagram. I don't think I could. (laughs) I don't know. Um, I'm such a loser. I'm just up in my game. Hashtag Jen Heber. Get on Hashtag old fashioned. (laughs) That's me. (laughs) To get and to listen to all of the shows on the Horse Radio Network, including Horsemanship Radio. Get the Horse Radio Network app for your iPhone or your Android. It's free and easy to use. Just go to your app store and search Horse Radio Network. If you're geeky and you've already done that, find some of your less than geeky old-fashioned friends like me and help them download the app. Yeah. (laughs) That's right. Exactly. But our, our sponsors, we want to thank them too, are very progressive and they're already on the app. And that is Omega Fields. Cavallo Horse and Rider, MontyRobertsUniversity.com. And we have our PSA at this season for the Ride Horse Initiative, the uh, MyRideHorse.org website. When you go to MyRideHorse.org, make sure you have time to shop because you will, you'll go down the rabbit hole oh. and you'll find all kinds of cute horses. Oh. I made that mistake the other day and I was late for an appointment because <laughs> just warning. Okay. Oh, you got I stuck did. on the horses. I know. I know. It is really fun. And it's put together by a really crack team of people. So it's updated all the time and it's very well vetted. So it's really cool. Yeah. And be sure to visit all the other great shows too on the Horse Radio Network at www.horseradionetwork.com. Until next time, have many happy horse hours.